Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Let me tell you, church, we have tried to record this teaching four times now. So if you want to know, this revelation that we're going to deliver today is powerful. So make sure that you have some notes and you're ready to get going on this. Because if the devil's trying to hinder it this much, God wants to bless you. So get, get some notes ready. We're going to get right into this. So, Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I command all satanic, all demonic hindrances from this word going forth to cease right now in Jesus' name. I pray this spiritual seed goes forth, gets sown in their hearts. Father, it produces carnally through their body, their mind, will, and emotions. Let this spiritual seed transform us into the image of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, this is a powerful teaching today. Because we're, what we're going to look at is offense. We're going to look at offense. We went through eight chapters of the Song of Solomon going verse by verse. Dealing with, you know, just reading through the Song of Solomon, trying to get a full understanding. And from there, we went into this thematic approach. We're looking at the themes of the Song of Solomon. And the first thing we looked at is like this love that matures. Love that grows into maturity. And this verse I want to read to you out of Philippians chapter 1. For God is my record how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all discernment or in judgment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense in the day of Christ. So we're talking about getting into a place where you're not where your love the love of God to you doesn't actually grow it's just the knowledge or the discernment of that love grows you start to understand this love more and more because the same way in which God loves God God loves you we did two teachings on that in our uh, lesson on the the fullness of God so if you want more teaching on that we did one says God loves God the next one is God loves you just go back and watch those two and yesterday we talked about being a sacrifice. What does it mean to be a sacrifice? Giving yourself first to God, then receiving from Him second. And what we want to look at today is this aspect of lovesick. So, a little bit of context going into the first verse that we're going to read today. is you see the affirmations of one. Apple tree, banquet house, and then you see her give this statement. In chapter 2, verse 5. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Now, I this this stay me with flagons. Stay me also means to rest. Flagons are raisin cakes. And when you study the word, you want to make sure that every phrase you study individually. Because people talk about the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost, and they talk about it as just one thing. You get a fresh start with the Holy Ghost. But that's not the same thing. Washing, yes, you get to start over, but regeneration means you start over completely different than how you started before. I lived 26 years of my life so far. If I started my 26 years over, if everything and all the circumstances were the same, you'd make the same choices. But if you start over completely different in a whole different place, different family, different rules, different mindsets, all of your life will look different. But they're two different phrases. So I want you to know this. When you study the word and you see two different phrases, don't combine them together. Study them individually. Because most people see this flagon or these raisin cakes as the same thing as the apples and make both of them to define refreshing. But they're not the same. This is just a tidbit on how you should study the word of God. Because it says, Stay me with flagons or rest in the raisin cakes. Raisin cakes were used in sacrificial burial offerings. And then comfort me or sustain and refresh me with apples. Apples refers to the word if you go back to verse 3. For I am sick of love. So what does it mean to be sick of love? What two things must be happening in your life for you to be sick of love? Or to be lovesick? We know lovesick is having affection or adoration to the degree that it makes you sick or grieve to be without him. And one of these is you must rest in the sacrificial burial offering of Jesus. That's one. And two is you must be refreshed or sustained by the word of God. Those two things together is what will cause lovesickness to come into your life. 
for you to be resting in what he's already done and refreshed by what he said about you. Because his affirmations, what he thinks and sees about you when you rest and walk in sacrifice will cause you to be lovesick. I want to move on into chapter 5. And I want to get my Bible out for this one because in chapter 5, this is one of the most powerful things in the Word of God is this, this, this section of Song of Solomon chapter 5. It's one of my favorites. In chapter 5, verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone away. My soul failed when he spake. I saw him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Now, the bridegroom has called her out, and she's came out in obedience. We don't have time to go into this fully today, but she's walking in obedience. And the point that you need to understand about her walking in obedience right now is she's going after him, but she cannot feel the manifest presence. There is seasons in your life where if you're walking wholeheartedly dedicated to God, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly, fully to God, that you're going to encounter seasons where you don't necessarily feel him. Where you have to walk by faith and not by sight. You have to know that he's with you even when you don't feel it. It's a powerful truth, church, because this will dis- this these moments in life when you don't feel it, but you either draw back or you push in, will determine whether you really are lovesick. It will determine if you really move forward in your walk with God. I want you to see this. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away my veil from me. So in this season, where she's following and going after God into the place that he's called her to be, and she doesn't necessarily feel his presence. She's just having to trust. She also gets persecuted. They wounded me. They smote me. They took away my veil. Veil representing her position in the church. They even took away my position out of the church. But then she says this phrase in Song of Solomon 5a, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love, that I'm love sick. I'm charging you to help me find my beloved and tell him that I'm love sick. I'm not offended. Church, this is powerful. Please get this. I'm not offended. They've taken my position away. They're persecuting me. They revile against me. They talk all negative against me, but I'm not offended. I'm not offended. Then the daughters ask, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou so dost charge us? Or dost so charge us? And then you have these from 10 to 16 in chapter 5. You need to read this and study this. The affirmations of the bride about the bridegroom and I just want to read one of them his head is as the most fine gold gold representing divinity his head representing leadership his leadership is divine he's sovereign he's powerful but his leadership is completely dedicated from God church this is powerful I am the Lord I change not Jesus the same yesterday today and forever I see the end from the beginning is what he said I'm the alpha the omega There is an aspect of assurance. We did a whole lesson on this, so go back and watch that. On being assured in what God says. But in the midst of her persecution, in the midst of her even losing her position in the church, she does not get offended. She's lovesick towards the bridegroom. And then in chapter 6, verse 1, Whether is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whether is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? Then the daughters of Jerusalem now ask, where is he that we can go with you? These immature believers, that's the daughters of Jerusalem, first ask, who is your beloved more than another beloved? What do you see in this man that we don't? There's many beloveds out there. Positions, jobs, positions in the body, family, relatives, children. There's all these other beloveds in this world. Status, wealth, all these things. Out of all the beloveds that are in the world, you say that this man is the greatest in your heart. That even in the midst of the persecution, 
even in the midst of losing position, even in the midst of all of this time where you can't even feel him. Now, Jesus never leaves you. The Holy Spirit abides. That's what it says. So I just want to make sure that's clear. We're not talking about him leaving you completely because the Spirit never leaves you. It abides forever. If you're born again, God never leaves you in the, in the whole sense. We're talking about this, the feeling of his presence. God telling you to move and you move even if you're not necessarily feeling him in it. You just, you're trusting because he said to do it. She said that I'm sick of love. I'm not drawn back. I'm not offended. Man, this is powerful, church. This progression where the bridegroom is, where, where, the, where the bride from the beginning says that I'm lovesick. But the way in which she sustained is through the word. And two, in the sacrificial bearing is where she rests. She rests in what he's already done. And she's refreshed by what he says about her, which causes lovesickness in her life. Now, she does draw back because of immaturity. But as she grows in maturity, she gets to the point where she doesn't draw back. And she's not offended. She's not offended. You see the affirmations of the bridegroom to the bride in chapter 4. The first four chapters is the bride's inheritance in him. And then the last four chapters is his inheritance in the bride. And in his inheritance in us, what we see is this level of maturity to where you grow up to where you're not offended. It doesn't matter what happens in life. It doesn't, nothing, nothing in life matters when it comes to your response to him that I'm lovesick I love you God you are my beloved I'm not drawing back I'm not going to be offended I'm looking at you my eyes are focused on you at all times so it doesn't matter what happens in this world I'm not offended at it I'm not going to draw back like I trust your your leadership I know you're sovereign. I know you have power. I know you're controlling these situations. I'm not offended. I'm not going to draw back. I want to read some verses from the Bible, and I want to I'm going to read them all real quick, and then I'm going to summarize it up so we have enough time to go through this. But Matthew 18, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, take thy one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If thou shalt neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And then we see in James chapter 3, it says, For in many things we offend all. If any man not offend in word, the same as a perfect man, and also able to bridle his whole body. John 16, these things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Matthew chapter 5, therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. What we see taught, most of the time in church is what do I do if I'm offended? But Jesus said in John 16, these things I've spoken unto you that you should not be offended. This is the last teaching before he went to the cross. But before that, he taught in Matthew 18 that if your brother trespass against thee. So what does that mean? There is a maturing that you get to a point where well, you're not offended. Now, there's two aspects of this that I really want to bring forth. One is Jesus said, I never do anything except what I see the Father do. And I never speak unless I first hear it from the Father. Amen. So everything Jesus said and everything he did was because of the Father. So that's why it says in James 3, 4, in many things we offend all. Your life, if you live according to what Jesus told you to do and you speak according to the word, people will be offended. People, all. That means we're talking believers and non-believers alike. All will be offended. Because Satan, the accuser of the brethren, brethren, will say, you're living pure and 
the person that's being offended is defiled. They're walking in compromise. And it will offend them that you walk perfect and holy and they are walking in compromise. But it says, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and shall be able to bridle his whole body. What does that mean? That means if you, let me make sure this is clear. When you speak, there's two different offenses that can happen. If I speak to you, I can one, be the one offending, which means these words are coming out of my mouth and it's about how I feel. That's called pride. That's, that's me caring about myself more than I care about you. But then there's the other things that I can say, which is the word of God. So if you get offended at that, you're not offended at me, you're offended at Jesus. Did you get that, church? When you speak, you either speak the word of God and what Jesus said, or you speak your own will. If you speak the word of God and they get offended, they're not offended at you, they're offended at Jesus. If you speak your own feelings about something, which means somebody persecutes you and they start talking negative and, and they start gossiping about you behind your back and you gossip about that other person, you're speaking your own stuff. If they get offended at that, that's because it was you. You weren't speaking the word. Now get this, church. This is powerful. I want you to understand this. You need to get a place of maturity, your love sickness with God, resting in his finished work and being sustained by his his word to the point that what he says about you is the only thing that matters amen if you're if what you rest in and what you're sustained by in life is what God said about you then you can say I seek not to please men for if I yet sought to please men I would not be a servant of God I don't I'm not looking for the affirmation from you I'm looking for the affirmation from God. And if God is my sustainment, then I'm not offended at what you say. You can't offend me because I know that God is sovereign and in control of everything and that God loves me and what he says about me is what's true about me. There's nothing you can do to offend me. That's the first part. The first part in your walk as a mature believer is not being offended. Even if they persecute you and take your position, even if they throw you, let's say they throw you in prison like they did Paul. Paul was not offended. Paul and Silas worshiped God and the prison doors were swung open. It says in the entire prison, but all stayed. Even the other prisoners didn't leave, even though the doors swung open. Because these men in the prison saw Paul and Silas not being offended. They weren't offended that they threw him in prison. They worshiped God and then got the jailer born again. You can't be offended at what people do to you. You cannot seek your validation from people. Your validation must come from God and God alone. That's the first part. The second part is you should not live your life in a way that causes people to be offended at you personally. Now, what you if you're sitting there and you're saying the word of God and people get offended, they're not offended at you, they're offended at Jesus. If you're doing what God tells you to do, if they get offended, then they're offended at what Jesus is saying for you to do, not at you. Make sure that's clear. But if you do something personally outside of what God has told you or outside of what God said, aka his word, Let's say you get upset at somebody and you start slandering back to them. You start gossiping. They persecute you and you revile back and they get offended. You can't walk in that way. Now, I, I know we're speaking a lot of different things, but I want to make sure this last part is clear. Because Matthew chapter 5, there's a powerful revelation here and I'm going to bring this out as we close. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. Thy brother. I want you to see this. When it talks about thy brother, we're talking about intimate, close, personal relationships. The people in your inner circle. Now this is where it gets powerful, church. If your brother has aught against you, if your brother is offended, it is now your job to reconcile. 
what this is important when it comes to about why do you need a tight circle? You don't need a lot of people that you're, oh, these are all my brothers. You got 50 people. Now you're not only responsible for you not being offended, but you have to be responsible for them being offended and making sure that you always keep the relationship reconciled. Amen. In Matthew 18, you see the immature part of a believer's walk to where if your brother's offending you, then you need to go to him. But you need to get to a point where Jesus said in John 16 that you should not be offended. You should never get offense. You should never take offense. And if somebody in your close circle is offended at you, it is now your responsibility to reconcile. That is a the pure in heart will see God. It takes humility to say that I'm not offended at you. What you've done to me, I'm, I, I'm not offended. But if you are offended, I'm going to come and reconcile it. Because I care more about this relationship and honoring God than I care about my own pride. I might not think I did anything wrong, but if you think I did, then I'm going to reconcile us. Because our relationship matters than the hindrance because your prayers will be hindered, church. The hindrances in your prayers could come from the fact you might not be offended. But if the other person is, it's your job to reconcile. That's what the word says. And I just want you to see this. I'm going to wrap this up. In Philippians 1 where it says that you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Listen to this. That's talking about the day of Christ is when Christ comes back. And Jesus in chapter 16 of John, when he said, These things I have spoken to you, that you shall not be offended. And this progression in the Song of Solomon, don't, don't miss, we're still in this progression of being lovesick, is all about not being offended in the midst of all situations. Church, Jesus was given this 13 to 17 in John, after talking about end times in Matthew 25, 24, 25. What Jesus is saying is, I'm in control. I'm going to die, but I will be raised. I'm coming back. Jesus wants you to be so sick of love for him and understand having the revelation of how much God loves God and how much God loves you because God loves you in the same way in which God loves God. This whole revelation of the love of God abounding through knowledge and judgment in your life, all these things, is dealing with the fact that if you are lovesick, you will not be offended. Then when all these end time judgments happen and all these things come into the, um, into the world and there's a great falling away from the body of Christ because people are offended. They don't know why God's letting things happen because they don't understand that he already said it was going to happen because we're looking for the great harvest and the purity of the church. I wish I had more time today to explain this today, but I, I don't. We're about to be out of time, so I want to finish this real quick in the next minute. You need to get to a place in your walk with God where you don't get offended at anybody for any reason. It doesn't matter what they do, what they say, or what they do to you. You don't be offended. You need to rest in the sacrifice of Jesus, what he's done about you, and then the apples, what he said about you. Let that sustain and refresh you. You need to find all of your validation and all of your worth in the Son of God alone. And if you do that, if your eyes are so focused on him, then you will never be offended. And, church, your close circle, your brothers, the people that you are intimately in relationship with, if you ever do or say anything and they are offended, it is now your responsibility to reconcile. You say, that's a big responsibility. It is. But if you want to walk like Jesus, then you, you're going to offend people because of your walk with him. But if you walk in true humility, the people that are close to you, your brothers, it is your responsibility to keep the relationships reconciled, to demonstrate the love of God to the greatest degree. We're out of time today, so we'll talk about this more tomorrow, church, on Sunday. So, Father, I bless you in Jesus' name. Let this word come alive to us. Teach us how not to be offended. Father, let your love be poured across our heart by the Holy Ghost. Let this knowledge and judgment abound in us so that we can be lovesick in you. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Church, I pray you have a wonderful day. Please make sure you follow, make sure you like, make sure you share it with all your friends. We'll see you tomorrow in church on Sunday. And I pray God blesses you in a mighty way the rest of your day. Have a great day, church.